you have your Bibles tonight, I'm not going to hold you too long. But as Paris said, just long enough. I want you to turn with me to Acts chapter 2. We're going to begin reading in verse number 1. Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse number 1, a very familiar passage of Scripture. Many of you know it. Many of you know it by heart. But there might be a few of you that are in here tonight that you may not quite understand it. Let's read Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And I want to use for a subject ministering just for a few moments tonight the sound of Pentecost. It's here again. The sound of Pentecost is here again. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. We thank you so much for your presence. We thank you for all that you have done for us and all that you are doing for us in this conference. We ask once again for your anointing to minister your word, your anointing to... Let us hear what you would have us to say. And tonight we are praying that every person that is under the sound of my voice that comes to this altar or is watching and listening somewhere around the world that your spirit would flood their souls and you would baptize them with the mighty infilling of the Holy Spirit. And we ask it all in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. This ministry has never been shy about our Pentecostalism. And thank God for that. When there are many other ministries that are leaving, are uh, maybe not as demonstrative as they should be regarding the moving and the operation of the Holy Spirit. I'm so glad that this church and this ministry is not ashamed of who we are. We're not ashamed to be declared Pentecostals. This ministry has seen, not only has it seen untold millions of people born again, but I believe that I can say without fear that this ministry has also seen untold millions baptized with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking with other tongues. And I'm glad to say that through three generations, from my grandfather to my father and to myself, that we're just getting started. Oh, I feel that this evening. We're just getting started. We have seen in these youth conferences, Dad and I were talking about this not too long ago, but as I mentioned last night, this is Jill and I's 22nd conference that we have been at the helm. And we have seen untold thousands of young people throughout these years from 2003 to 2024 go through to the infilling of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking with other tongues. And many of you know how that we like to do it. There's a routine that we go by that was actually learned by my grandfather, and I'm going to share that in just a moment. And you would see how when we invite people that needs the either the infilling of the Holy Spirit or a refilling, we always call them forward. And we always have spirit-filled believers to stand behind them, a man behind a man, a woman behind a woman. 
We give instructions, and then those that are behind those, in, those individuals who are seeking the infilling of the Holy Spirit help us to lay hands on all of these individuals, and many times, many of them go through to the infilling of the Holy Spirit. But you see, it wasn't always like that. I want to take you back, and I don't know the year. I wasn't even born, so it really doesn't matter. When my grandfather's ministry was starting to take off, it was starting to pick up steam. And I believe the story goes that he was in Canton, Ohio. And the Lord began to deal with him about preaching on the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And when he did, hundreds came forward that night to be filled with the Spirit. But not really understanding or knowing what to do, my grandfather would do what we call the old school way of doing it. He would literally pray for each person individually. And whenever you have a crowd of maybe five or you know, seven or 10, that's feasible. But when you have crowds of 200 that are coming forward, not, we're, talking, we're not talking about the audience members. We're talking about 200 plus people coming down to receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Laying hands on each one of them is quite a task. And according to the story, my grandfather would say that very few received that night. And in his words, he said, when he got back to the hotel, he said, God, I'm never doing that again. Never doing that again. He said he felt dejected because of the lack of response, if you will. But there was a cassette tape that I don't know how he got it. Some of you don't even know what a cassette tape is. You recycle teenagers do. A lot of you other teenagers, you have to Google it after church. What is a cassette tape? And if you're trying to figure out how to spell it, it's C-A-S-S-E-T-T-E. -S -S -E. <laughs> he had a cassette tape of a, another minister. And the strange thing or the funny thing is, is that this minister and my grandfather, they didn't really see eye to eye on a lot of things. There were a lot of differences of opinion. But he picked up that cassette tape and he played it. Now, we'll not call the brother's name. He passed away some years ago anyway. But in this cassette tape, this gentleman, this preacher, this brother began to lay out step by step how to pray for hundreds of individuals to receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And like I said, I wasn't born then, but I can only imagine that as my grandfather was listening that he began to take notes. Oh, that's how it's done. Oh, I like that. Oh, this is good right here. And he began to mark everything out. And as he began to look at the instructions that was provided on that cassette tape, the Holy Spirit spoke and said, that's how you do it. That's how you do it. The next, I guess it was a few days later, he was in, I believe, the city of Toledo, Ohio, at a businessman's luncheon or brunch or whatever it was in Toledo, Ohio, and the Lord spoke to him and said, I want you to pray for, for believers to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And he said he couldn't wait. He couldn't wait to get there to that service and that luncheon of that, that, that full gospel businessman. That's what it was. It just came to me. That full gospel businessman's luncheon. The place was jammed. And when he began to preach on the mighty infilling of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God began to flood that place. And he began to relay the same instructions that he had just received a few days prior. And listen, there were hundreds that came forward that night. I mean, hundreds that came forward in Toledo, Ohio. And when he began to go through the same instructions that we're going to go through here a little bit later tonight, he said it was almost like every single one of them that came forward went through to the baptism with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking with other tongues. 
And if my memory serves me correct, there was a lady in attendance. She was a Nazarene. And when she got filled, she came up to my grandfather and said, everything you said about the Holy Spirit is so much better. It's so much better. It's so much better. And as that night, you can imagine, I, like I cannot imagine what he was feeling like that night, seeing hundreds of individuals going through to the infilling of the Holy Spirit. But it was at that moment that the Spirit of God spoke to him and said, if you will believe me, I will fill 1,000 people with the Holy Spirit in one service. Think about that. Here it was, just seeing a couple of hundred, and yet the Spirit of God speaks and says, if you will believe me, I will fill a thousand people in one night, in one service, if you will just believe me. Years went by. I don't know if he had forgotten that or not. But almost 40 years ago, I believe it was September the 9th, 1984, the world's most famous arena, New York City, Madison Square Garden, on that Sunday afternoon, Twenty-two thousand people were in attendance. Twenty-two thousand people were in attendance. And when he gave that altar call for believers to receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit, they started to descend from the top of Madison Square Garden to the middle section, to the bottom floor. They started marching towards the front of that of that arena. There were thousands, literal thousands that came forward that night or that afternoon to receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking with other tongues. I want you just to take a look at it as he would begin to give the instructions and he would begin to speak over those people and they would begin to, the Spirit of God begin to move. He said it was almost like one after another, after another, after another, after another. We're going through to the infilling of the Holy Spirit. That night, he was boarding a plane from New York City to London. And as he was on that plane, the Spirit of God began to move upon him and brought that event back to his mind from Toledo, Ohio. And the Spirit of God said, do you remember what I told you? That I would fill a thousand people in one service in one night. He said, yes, I do. And the Lord spoke and said, how many were filled tonight? Dad would know this better than I, but I believe that there was over a thousand documented individuals who received the baptism with the Holy Spirit. That afternoon, December the 9th, 1984, almost 40 years ago. And on that plane ride, the Lord spoke again. And he said, if you'll believe me, I will fill 10,000 in one night, in one service. Now, I'm going to stop here, and I'm going to change directions for a moment. I want to share a dream that I had many years ago, and let me preface by saying this, that ever since that I was a child, ever since that I was a child, God would speak to me in the form of dreams. 
It doesn't happen all the time. It doesn't happen often. But there were times, even in my childhood, my teenage years, and especially in my early adult years, that God would speak to me in the realm and through dreams. And one night, as I drifted off to sleep, I believe the Lord gave me a dream. I was in an auditorium. There was a mass of humanity as far as the eye could see. From front to back, left to right, there was no room for anyone else in that auditorium. I don't know how many people that were there. It, was, it seemed like it was endless. We were on a large platform. My wife was up there singing. And I was standing on stage left, and as I was standing there about ready to take the microphone to minister in that dream, for whatever reason, I, I was panicking because I did not have a text. And let me tell you something. All of our ministers know we like to prepare. We like to hear from God. We like to know well in advance what we're going to be preaching. But sometimes it doesn't happen that way. Sometimes you will be seeking God and you will hear nothing. Sometimes you will be praying and you will hear nothing. Sometimes you'll be studying and you hear nothing. And the moment you take the platform, God drops it into your spirit. And in this dream, that's exactly what was happening. I was standing there on stage left and I was panicking, not knowing. I had been seeking and praying and nothing was, nothing was in my spirit. And I was troubled. And in this dream, as Jill finished whatever it was, that her, her session, her music, her, her, her special, whatever it was that she was doing, as I took the microphone and I placed my Bible on the podium, the Holy Spirit dropped a passage in my heart, and I don't remember what it was, but I knew it had to do with the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And whenever I read my text and said my title. The only thing I remember is this, would you bow your heads? And when I said that, dead sinner, in this dream, a man stood up, lifted up his hands, and began to go through to the infilling of the Holy Spirit. It was an ember. And it just began to flow little by little. And next thing you know, there was another group over here. They stood up and went through to the infilling of the Holy Spirit. There was another one over here that went through to the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And before I knew it, the entire audience was standing speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave the utterance. And I believe the Holy Spirit is telling us here tonight, if we will just believe him, that if we would just believe him, I said if we just believe him, we are going to see thousands upon thousands upon thousands baptized with the Holy Spirit at one time. And some of you say, how can that happen? We've got scores of people that watch this broadcast each and every single week and each and every single day. And I believe there's coming a day and there's coming an hour where the power of God's going to flow. It's so strong that not only will it affect Family Worship Center, it will affect the entirety of this world. I believe, as I said a moment ago, that what we saw back 40 years ago was just a little preview. It was just a preview for what God is getting ready to do. It was just a dress rehearsal for what God is getting ready to do. And what we saw then, it will be multiplied by multiplied by multiplied from here on out because I believe we're just getting started. Hallelujah. We're just getting started. We're just getting cranked up. We're just getting going. Devil, you ain't seen nothing yet. We're getting ready to touch this world one more time. 
Somebody ought to shout in this place tonight. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> We're getting ready. <laughs> I've said it before, forgive me for saying it again, the devil thought that he knocked the man down, but what he failed to take into consideration was that God was not just going to raise him back up, but he was going to raise his entire family up. So devil, you ain't got to put up with one swagger. You got to put up with a whole parcel of swaggers. And we'll stand here preaching the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ till the day I die. Woo! We're just getting cranked up. <laughs> Somebody told me the other day, they wrote me a letter. They said, we don't like it when you run around too much. You're too animated for us. Honey, you ain't seen nothing yet. But God is getting ready to pour out his spirit. In the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Young people, get ready. Young people, get ready. I said teenagers, get ready. College students, get ready. College students, get ready. High school students, get ready. When you leave this place, you're not leaving dry and cold and dead. You're leaving full of the power of Almighty God and the power of the Holy Ghost. And you're going to turn your cities right side up for the cause of Jesus Christ. Praise God. I believe it. I said, I believe it. I said, I believe it. <laughs> the book of Acts in our text. I want them to put verse 1 back on the screen, please. There's a word that's found in verse 2, but I want to pick it up with verse 1 that I want to focus on tonight. And like I said, I'm not going to hold you too long, but I want us to read it. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord, in one place, right one mind, one mind, one heart, one place. You see, there was a unity there that evening, like there's a unity here tonight. Oh, my Lord, I feel that. He said they were all in one accord in one place. Verse 2, please. And listen, and there suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And I want to focus on that word, sound, tonight. But in order to bring to you what I feel the Lord is leading upon my heart to do, talking about that sound, Pentecost has a distinct sound. Oh, I, <laughs> Pentecost has a distinct sound. There is nothing like it anywhere else in the world. It is a distinct sound. But what is that sound? What is it? What do you mean there is a distinct sound when it comes to Pentecost? I want you to turn to Joel chapter 2. If you don't want to turn there, believe me, it's there. You can see it on the screen. I won't steer you wrong, I promise. I want them to put Joel chapter 2 verse 1 on the screen. There are three things that I want to deal with here tonight. There's more, but I only want to focus on three because of time tonight. The first thing about this sound of Pentecost that I want to deal with is found in verse 1 of Joel chapter 2. Joel is known as the Holy Spirit prophet of the Old Testament. 
Now, even though there were others who prophesied about the baptism with the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking with other tongues, it was Joel that Peter spoke of and that Peter quoted on the day of Pentecost. I, read it, I said it just a moment ago. He said, these men are not drunk as you suppose, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, that I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. The sound of Pentecost has a distinct sound. And the very first sound that it has is found in verse 1. The Scripture says, Blow you the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all of the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord comes, for it is near at hand. The first point I want to bring up about the sound of Pentecost is that it is a sound of an alarm. Do you realize tonight that every person from the early church days to the birth of the early church to now, every person that goes through to the infilling of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking with other tongues, it is an alarm to the world that time is almost up. Now, did you hear me tonight? The sound of Pentecost, this first sound, the sound of an alarm is meant for the world. A world that has ignored God. A world that has rejected God. A world that has forsaken God. A world that has tried to eliminate God from its very conscience. And yet every single time a person goes through to the infilling of the Holy Spirit, that is a sign and it is a sound of an alarm to the entirety of the world that the rapture of the church is near at hand. Now let me help you with this. This is why, once again, it is ever so important, every youth pastor, Every pastor, every youth worker, every youth leader, every senior pastor, every senior helper or usher or whatever it may be. This is why it is so important that you and I, we are to be about our Father's business. We are not to build our own kingdom. Now let me help you. Let me say it better. We're not to build our brand. We're not here to build our brand. You're not here to build your brand. You're here to tell the world that Jesus Christ is soon to come. It is up to us as ministers of the gospel not to promote ourselves, but to promote Jesus Christ and him crucified. Every time when tonight, and I'm believing every single person, that comes forward and is watching and listening will go through to the infilling of the Holy Spirit. That should be an alarm to the entirety of the world that God's prophetic time clock is nearing an end. And knowing that there are, let, let me help you, let me just say this real quick. How many of you love sports? Where's the rest of you? Let me, let me just get a little bit further. How many love football? How many, how many like soccer? All right, let's, let's use both of those because they're both called football. <laughs> let's just say this for example. The score is tied. You're looking up at the clock, and you see the clock is running in reverse. Seconds are ticking off. And if you're like me, whether it's soccer or whether it's football, and if you're like me and you're watching that game and you're watching the clock begin to tick backwards and you're saying you're seeing it five minutes to four minutes to three minutes to two minutes, if you're anything like me, you're not laying down. You're engaged in the game. You're standing up and your heart and I'll just go ahead and make half of you mad. When it comes to football, I'm a diehard LSU fan for college and a diehard Dallas Cowboy fan for pro. 
I hear those boos over there. Y'all know we can, we can have a deliverance service after church tonight too. But as you're watching the game and you're seeing the clock tick down five minutes, four minutes, three minutes, and especially if your team has the ball, you are doing everything you're, you, you can in your, in your armchair quarterback way of trying to will your quarterback to get down the field to score that touchdown, right? And whenever they miss a play, oh. You see, whenever it comes to sports, and we see all that, we, we were so much invested in that outcome. And guess what? You don't matter in it. I don't matter in it. I may wear my Dallas Cowboy jersey, but I don't matter. They're not at home thinking, what is Gabriel thinking about this play? We don't matter. And yet we're still so invested in that ball game. I was there, I'm gonna make fun of Keith for a second. I brought Keith. Keith is a resident Alabama fan. He's sitting there behind, right beside my dad. How them two can sit together, I have no idea. <laughs> but I brought Keith with me two years ago to Tiger Stadium when they played Alabama. Brian Kelly's first year. And it was a tie ball game. Or we were down by one, I take that back. Down by one. We went into overtime, down by one. We had scored a touchdown, we could just kick the field goal or the extra point and go into another overtime. And then you see Jalen Daniels walking back out on the field. And you see the offense starting to line up. And all of Tiger Stadium is buzzing. We're down by one, no time left, and we have one play, a two-point conversion. This will either seal it or we'll lose it. And either one of us, me or Keith, is going to go home mad and glad. <laughs> Keith is on the edge. He's standing up. I think he's standing on the, on, the, on the stadium seating. And I'm standing right next to him, and we're just holding each other. <laughs> just like, what, what, what's going on? What's going to happen? And when Jalen Daniels found Mason, what's his name? Uh, Taylor. Mason Taylor in the end zone to win the game. You want to you know what Keith did? Keith didn't even bother to sit down. He didn't even bother to say congratulations. He took off walking so far ahead of me. And I'm trying to yell at him, Keith, Keith, he's doing this. You see, when we get so invested in a sporting event that we go crazy when we win or when we lose, but not know this, we don't matter in this. But how much more should we be knowing that time is ever running out on us and that souls are literally hanging in the balance? How much more? You see, that is what we can be invested in. That is what we can be invested in, knowing there's souls that are hanging in the balance. The sound of Pentecost is a sound of an alarm. The time is running out. That's externally. That's for the world. But I want you to look at verse 15, please. Now we're going to get internal. We're not going to look at the world right now. We're going to look at the church. Because as the first sound of Pentecost is a sound of an alarm, that time is running out. The second sound of Pentecost is found in verse 15. I'll blow you the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children. Those who suck the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber. Let the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar. And let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and give not your heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, where is their God? The second sound of Pentecost is the sound of repentance. It is the sound of weeping, fasting, 
and prayer. I want to ask you a question tonight. Do you weep over your own sin in your life? Does your heart break over your own sin? Does your heart break for the sin of those around you and the effects of sin that is having on your society? Jesus would say, and I believe the greatest teaching in the world, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus would say in the Beatitudes, blessed are they who mourn for they shall be comforted. What that means is this. It is not just mourning over just random things. It's mourning over your own personal sin. And it's mourning over the sin of others and what Satan is doing to affect our nation, our communities, our cities, our towns, our villages, our family. We're talking about repentance you see, whenever a person goes through to the infilling of the Holy Spirit, I truly believe this, and as the Spirit of God begins to move upon their heart and move upon their life, that the Holy Spirit is going to begin to convict them of sin. He's going to convict you. He's going to move upon you and press those buttons to say, that's not right. Lay that aside. You're too comfortable. You need to get rid of those friends, as they mentioned last night and this morning. You need to lay down that relationship. You need to lay down this. You need to lay down, that's not right. Don't go there. That's not, that's not biblical. That's not, you see, the, the Holy Spirit is very good at telling us what's wrong with us. Why? Because he's trying to fix us. He's trying to sanctify us to perfect us. Do we weep over sin? Do we weep over the lost? Do we weep over the lost within our family? Or are we so comfortable that it doesn't bother us? He said that the elders would weep between the porch and the altar. The porch signified relationship with God. The altar typified the cross. Before you can have relationship with God, you need to come first by the way of the cross. And here's the thing. Do we, as ministers, weep over our congregation? Do we weep over our congregation, knowing that we see our congregation heading in a wrong direction? Do we weep between the porch and the altar and asking God to, 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 do, to do something to move amongst them, to move in their hearts and to move in their lives? Or are we so concerned with building our brand that we lose sight of what our true responsibility is? Weeping, but also in this scripture it says that call a solemn assembly and a fast and pray. Fasting, I know a lot of people have their issues with fasting. And listen, fasting, I believe, is very scriptural. It is biblical. It's something that we as believers need to take seriously. But understand, fasting doesn't earn you anything with God. Fasting itself will not break the chains of sin in your life. It won't do that. But what fasting does, it is saying to God, I am so desperate. I am so desperate for you that I will forego anything just so I can be in your presence. I will forego anything. And how desperate are we for the things of God tonight? How desperate are we for the things of God? It is said, I, I remember back 20 some odd years ago, dad took me to Los Angeles, California. He was preaching in a meeting at a 
Foursquare Church, one of our former Bible college students was pastoring a Foursquare Church. And on that particular trip, we went to Bonnie Bray Avenue, the home where the Azusa Street Revival broke out, where William J. Seymour, it is said that he would spend hours in a literal closet seeking God, foregoing everything, foregoing food, foregoing sleep, seeking the face of God, saying, Lord, you've got to move. Lord, you've got to move. You've got to do something. We can't stand it without you. We, we can't stand living without your prayer. We've got to have more of you. It is stated that at the Azusa Street Revival, when you would walk in to that mission, you would see him, uh, Brother Seymour, his head in an apple crate crying out to God, Lord, you've got to move. You've got to move. We're talking about desperation. Are we desperate for God? Are we desperate to change our ways? And the third is prayer. Prayer is a lost art in church today. I have a question for you tonight. Do you pray? And I don't mean, now I lay me down to sleep. And I don't mean, Lord, bless this food. Nurse it to our bodies. That's not what I'm talking about. But do you have a heart for prayer? To seek the face of God. Night in and night out. Saying, God, we can't do this without you. It was stated, my dad would say this, and I was a kid, and I don't remember this. But my dad has said this hundreds of times throughout the years. That in the middle of the night, he would be awakened from a, a, a deep sleep, hearing someone outside. And he would go to that window and pull back the curtains and he would see my grandfather outside walking in the middle of the night, crying out to God, God, you've got to anoint us. You've got to help us. You've called us to touch this world. We cannot do this without you. We cannot do it without the power and the presence of Almighty God. That's what I'm talking about. That's the kind of prayer that I'm talking about. Do you pray? Do you seek God? You see, the second sound of Pentecost is a sound of repentance. Laying aside the sin that does easily beset us. Putting our attention on the Lord of glory. And saying, Lord, you've got to move. We're desperate we're hungry. And the scripture says that if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, the scripture says, then I'll hear from heaven. Then will I forgive their sin and then will I heal their land. The first sound is the sound of an alarm to the world. The second is a sound of repentance. And when the church has made it right with God, there is a third sound. I want you to look real quick. Verse 21. They're going to put it up on the screen. It's going to be there. I promise. See? The third sound. Listen to this. Fear not. O oh, land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. The third sound is the sound of rejoicing and gladness, that God is going to do great things, that God is going to do great and mighty things. Oh, I wish. I could have the words to properly enunciate this. But here's the thing that you've got to understand. You need to start believing God for big things. 
Hey, hey, this is not just a mantra. This is a way of life for us. It began with my grandfather as a child when his grandmother would tell him, Jimmy, God is a big God. So ask big. That has rolled all over this family. And this family has taken on that responsibility of saying it's not just stopping with him. It's, it's, it's really, it's, it's boiled down to the entirety of our swaggered family. That we as a family believe God because he is a big God. So we are asking and believing big. Let me put it to you like this. Let me put it to you in my terminology, what we used to say as kids. Quit believing for small potatoes. Quit believing for small things. Quit believing for little things. And start asking God for the whole enchilada. Start asking God for big things. Start believing him for the absolute impossible. Why? Because God is a God of the impossibilities. Woo! I, oh, my Lord, I feel this. God is a God of the impossibilities. You've got something to rejoice about. Why? Because God is able to do the absolute impossible. Hold on for a second. Thank you. I'm looking out across the crowd. And I see some praisers in this place. I heard somebody in the back. I see praisers all throughout this conference. I've watched you. I've watched you come in on Wednesday night. And you're a little kind of iffy not sure in what is going on, and some of you have never been here before, and you don't really know what to expect. But by this morning, you are no longer a spectator. You are down here at this front because something got a hold of you. And you begin to understand, my God is a big God. I'm no longer going to ask and settle for small things, but I want to believe God for the absolute impossible. I'm believing God not just for Baton Rouge. I'm not believing God just for Louisiana. I'm not believing God for the southeastern portion of the United States. And I'm not believing God just for the USA. I'm believing God for the entirety of this world. that God is able to do the absolute impossible. Guess what? I just feel like something good is about ready to happen. You need to start believing, my God can, my God can, my God is able. Stay standing just for a second. I'm going to need your help here. You see, as I mentioned, you're, 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 you're praisers. Do you realize that Pentecostals should be praisers? Yeah. Hold on. Pentecostals should not come to church like this. You shouldn't come to church sitting on God's pew, sucking God's air, and doing nothing. You're Pentecostal. That means you got something to praise him about. You got a dance in your step. You got a song in your heart. You got something to stand up about. You got something to square your shoulders about. You got something to raise your hands about. You got something to jump about. And you got something to dance about. Say, Sandy, Psalm 29, I'm going to show you something for a moment. Talking about how that you're supposed to be praisers. Psalm 29, I'm going to get this right quick. Yes, I have an iPad. <laughs> Some of you think that, oh, it's ungodly. It's the Bible. It's just a digital version. And guess what? It's the expositors, too. <laughs> I want to talk to you a little bit about praisers for a second. 
just, just bear with me for just a moment. Psalm 29, we're going to start in verse 1. Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty, talking about angels. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord glory that is due unto his name. <laughs> Worship the Lord in beauty and holiness. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The, glory, the God of glory thunders. The Lord is upon the waters. Now listen, the voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Yea, the Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes them also to skip like a calf. Lebanon, Syrian, like a young unicorn. Some of you are like, what is going on? Just bear with me. I'm getting there. The voice of the Lord divides the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the hinds, the calf, discovers the forest. Now listen, this is it. Read it right here. The last phrase, and in his temple, does everyone speak? Hold on. That's not what it originally says. Look at that line right there. The actual Hebrew rendering is, does everyone say? Glory. Oh, come on now. Come on now. It says, does everyone, when you walk into the temple of God, when you walk into church, you don't need to have a sour face on you. You need to stand up, raise your hands, and say, Glory! 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 Does everyone shout glory? Woo! It is a sound of rejoicing because God is going to do great and mighty things. When you enter in to the church house, you don't enter in stuck in the mud. You enter in shouting glory. Somebody give God praise in this place. It is the sound of rejoicing. It's the sound of gladness. It's the sound that God is getting ready to pour out his spirit one more time. I want to make the devil just that much angrier. And I want to say it one more time. When you enter into the church, you need to shout. Glory. That was okay. You can do better on this Friday night. When you enter in to this church house, everyone shouts. Glory. Hey! Glory. Give God praise in this place tonight. When you shout glory, you are saying God is able. When you shout glory, you're saying God can. When you shout glory, you say devil, you are defeated in the name of Jesus. It is a shout and a sound of rejoicing because God will do great and mighty things. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise tonight. Singers and musicians, come on back here tonight. Stay standing. I'm closing with this. If you're here tonight and you say, Pastor Gabe, I have not yet received the infilling of the Holy Spirit, and I need it tonight. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. I just want you to come down to this front right now. Come on right now. Singers and musicians, come on right now. Just if you need the infilling of the Holy Spirit, come on down. That's it. Come on, young man. Come on. I love that. He was running to the altar. He was running to the altar. Come on. Come on as quick as you can. Anybody else? How many would say, Pastor Gabe, I once was filled, but I'm dry, and I haven't, I haven't spoken in tongues in forever. If that's you, I want you to come down to this front, too. Come on down right now. I want you to sing, Welcome Holy Spirit. Welcome Holy Spirit right now. Come on. Get as close as you can to this front. 
Come on, sing it right now. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Now give me a spirit-filled believer if you can. I need some spirit-filled believers to come and gather around these right now. Fill us with your power. And I need you to do me a favor and just try to stand behind someone. Man behind a man, woman behind a woman. Get as close as you can right now to this front. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. that came forward to look at Pastor Gay for just a second. We're going to give you some instructions. She already got it over there. I want to give you some simple instructions on how to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And this goes for all of you that are watching and listening, wherever you may be around the world. I want you to follow along with us. The first thing you need to know is that the only requirement for you to be baptized with the Holy Spirit is to be saved. You don't have to belong to a church. You don't have to belong to Crossfire IYC. You don't have to belong to SBN, JSM, or any other man-made church or organization. You just need to belong to the body of Christ. And if you're not sure if you're saved here tonight, all you've got to do is say, Lord, forgive me of my sin and come into my heart. Secondly, we teach and we preach that every person that comes through that comes to and comes through to the infilling of the Holy Spirit will speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave the utterance. What are tongues? Tongues are a language known and spoken somewhere on this planet, but not yet known to you. It is not gibberish. It's not a made-up language. It is a legitimate language according to Acts chapter 2, verse 11. We know that. It is a real language known somewhere on this planet, whether in a time past or presently, but not yet known to you. And in a moment, we're going to ask you just to repeat a simple prayer after me. The only prayer in English that I want you to pray is, Father, in the name of Jesus, by faith, I receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And when you pray that prayer, you're going to begin to sense words and languages right here in your innermost being. The Scripture says that out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living waters. And here's what you've got to do when you begin to sense those words and languages in your innermost being. Open your mouth, yield your tongue, and begin to speak what you sense and feel. All of this comes down to a simple truth, faith. You've got to believe it. You don't need to beg for it. You don't need to plead for it. God wants to give it to you. It is a gift. 
a free gift given to his people. And I want you to believe it and say, Lord, I believe that I'm going to receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Now raise your hands right now. I'm going to ask those who came down to lay hands on them in just a moment. And we're going to pray right now. I want those of you that are watching and listening, I want you to pray with us right now. And I want you to believe. Some of you may say, well, there's nobody here to lay hands on me. Oh, yes, there is. Jesus himself is right there with you to lay hands on you. Now let's pray right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you tonight. We ask right now that you would begin to move and pour out your spirit upon every single young man, young lady, boy, girl, mom and dad that's here and that is under the sound of our voice. We believe right now that everyone that came forward will go through to the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And right now, by faith, we declare it. Be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. Now lay hands on them right now. Come on right now. Sing it one more time. Welcome, Holy Spirit. That's it, that's it.
Holy Spirit and take control. Can you sing that, please? Come on, just lift your hands right now. Just keep going through. Don't worry about a stop, but just keep going through. Flow over my soul. Oh, yes. Can your Holy Spirit Let your Holy Spirit come. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise tonight. And let me talk to you for one second before we dismiss. For every one of you that came here and you received the infilling of the Holy Spirit, I want to encourage you, use it every day. Speak it every day. No matter where you are, Pray in tongues. That is your prayer language. Use it every day. But for those of you that you may have come down here to this, this evening and you say, you know, Pastor Gabe, I didn't get it tonight. Don't be discouraged. Your day is coming. Your day is coming. You keep believing. And I believe that there's going to be some of you, you're going to get filled when you get over to the amphitheater tonight. And when you get it, when you come up from that water, you're going to get baptized with the Holy Spirit. Keep believing. Some of you are going to get it in your hotel room tonight. Some of you are going to get it in the bus ride or on the plane ride home. Wouldn't that be a sight? I want you to turn around, tell your neighbor you love them. We're going to meet you over there at the amphitheater right after service. We love you. God bless you. We'll see you there tonight and see you in tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock for our evening service. We love you. God bless you. Come Holy Spirit, move on me. By your anointing, set me free. Pour out new wine on this thirsty heart of mine. Come Holy Spirit, move on me.
We hope you've enjoyed this live service from International Youth Conference 2024. For more information, visit our website at jsmiyc.org.